The Jemadar finished off Season 2 of Deep Space Nine, significant because DS9 was a bit different than the other three Trek series of its era due to its setting. TNG, Voyager, and Enterprise were about ships on a journey, and thus about an issue of the week before they moved on to something else. With the exception of Season 3 of Enterprise, these shows weren't part of any general thematic direction or major subplots, but DS9 was different. While there is an odd excursion to study the Gamma Quadrant, for the most part the action was reacting to events. Even when the crew was proactive, it was still usually in response to some kind of threat that was out there from one of the major powers that they had to worry about. So while the other three series tended towards season-ending cliffhangers, TNG had four out of six, Voyager had four out of six, and Enterprise had two out of three, these were still just individual tales, but DS9 didn't approach it that way. These seasons didn't end with a story that would be resolved in the first episode of the next season and ended with a complete story that set the groundwork for the next season's direction. Uh, the exception is the adversary. It didn't quite set up season four because the series needed to draw in more viewers, so they put the Dominion stuff on hold and went with Worf and the Klingons. But otherwise, the episodes laid out major shifts whose consequences would be seen in the following season. Of course, this was still early in the series, and so it wasn't anticipated. The end of Season 1 showed that there was some Bajoran resentment towards the Federation, but it seemed to have been resolved, rather than leading towards the early conflicts that we would see in Season 2. But that was a necessity, given that the show was establishing itself. They couldn't be too direct in this hanging issue, because they couldn't risk uh, having a downer ending on Season 1. They needed to have something a bit more upbeat. But throughout Season 2, there was a second thread that was emerging. There were more episodes about refugees in the Gamma Quadrant, running from some kind of threat. And completely separate from that, Quark going on an adventure for the Nagus that involved trying to contact a powerful economic group called the Dominion. It comes together now in the most unlikely of starts, with Cisco talking to Jake about his science project. That's it? You're just going to watch it grow? You do know that that's what a lot of science is, right? Observing and then noting the results? But don't you think it's a little low-tech? Tis tis tis. How are you expecting this to become a menace to threaten the station, hmm? Don't you know that that's the only reason that science is performed in this franchise, young man? You have to have innocuous-seeming projects threaten everyone with a horrible death somehow. You go to your room and think about that, mister. So, Cisco wants to know if there's something else you'd like to do for a project. Learn how to pilot a runabout? Ha, like you're ever going to need to know how to do that. Option 2 is doing a planetary survey in the Gamma Quadrant, which Cisco is excited about, even through the meeting about the mundane stuff like a new Bajoran colony in the Gamma Quadrant and the arrival of the galaxy-class starship USS Odyssey. It's a shame I'll have to miss your reunion with Captain Keel. Don't you find him just a little arrogant? Funny, he said the same thing about you. I like him already. More good news, Jake has invited Nog to be his partner for the science project, so this father-son trip will have a guest, much to Sisko's chagrin. What a waste, like Nog is ever going to need to know how to do a planetary survey or any other Starfleet stuff. While he grudgingly gives in, another Ferengi wants something from him, Quark. He wants to sell merchandise through the station's monitors, but Sisko refuses because... Maybe it's because he doesn't like you. Yeah, probably. I'm leaving this station. No, no, stay, I insist. Oh, because you like me? <laughs> no, <laughs> God, no. I want you to help the station's economy. Oh, well, in that case, I'm sure it's all right that I use the monitors to sell things and improve the economy, right? <laughs> Hell no. Now go away. Just don't leave the station. But with Nog going along on the trip, well, this is the perfect opportunity for one-on-one -on -one time with Cisco. All Quark needs to do is bring the charm, which is easy for him. It's just that bringing the charm that's not transparently false, that's the hard one. No offense. Some of my best friends are humans, but my brother Rom isn't as liberal as I am. Rom? Not liberal enough? Rom's the Ferengi equivalent of someone whose house is made of driftwood and vegan bricks, built after an environmental impact study at a Native American anthropology task force, so he has a place to house his three foster children. Of course, Cisco isn't buying it. But Quark's persistence and Jake's desire not to leave Nog behind convinces him to take Quark along, too. If worse comes to worse, they could probably eat him. Things don't go well when Quark doesn't appreciate the planet they've found. I suppose you want to cut down all these trees and start strip-mining the entire planet. 
nonsense. You detonate the planet and then send in drones to mine the asteroids. I mean, that's just business 101. As someone who's been on too many camping trips, I sympathize completely with Quark's irritation with the annoying aspects of the great outdoors. Except that he could just as easily return to the runabout. But no, no, he's going to stay down here and get to the good friends with Cisco and all that. Which he will accomplish by bitching about how much he hates this place. I'm not really sure if there's a rule of acquisition covering this one, but there probably should be. Of course, Starfleet generally doesn't grasp economics and the like anyway. If he did, Cisco might suggest that he could support using the monitors for business if Quark did some things for him, like agreed to improve the working conditions for his staff, since all the senior officers seem to feel that they deserve that. I mean, you could easily have Quark to go along with that, too, by just telling him it's a bribe. You know, Cisco just wants it paid to the employees instead of himself. Ferengi are fine with bribery. They just don't like generosity. The antics continue into the night until Quark sets himself on fire. By accident, not in protest of Cisco's decision. So Nog runs off in embarrassment. Up until now, this has seemed like a pretty pedestrian character episode. Sure, Cisco and Quark don't often get to interact, but so far it hasn't been wowing us. Basically, Quark's only interested in networking, not actually bonding with Cisco, and Cisco, well, seems to have a bit of that sense of human superiority that has often been on display in Star Trek. It's basically the answer to the last outpost when the Ferengi were first introduced as hunched over animal like savages while tall Riker stood proudly amidst them with a condescending expression at their apishness. Well, Quark calls Cisco on this Federation attitude that looks down on anyone that doesn't remind them of themselves. We'll pick it up later. First, we have Eris running into the camp and hitting Cisco with a ball of telekinesis. You're it! But that's not a big enough surprise. So seconds later, cloaked humanoids appear and have them surrounded. The Jem'Hadar. Dun dun dun! Naturally, Jake and Nog are confused and worried when they return to camp. Nog's worried that a wild animal might have gotten them. I heard my dad. There aren't any wild animals, just insects and plants. Maybe they were attacked by a vicious tree. These woods are the feeding ground of a great white pine. Quark panics in the face of all of this, so Cisco comforts him the only way he knows how. I have the right to express my opinion. I'm about to put my fist in your opinion. Whoever said violence never solved anything has apparently not seen that for Cisco, it has indeed managed to somehow solve everything. Actually, when it becomes clear to him that Quark's only doing this because he's terrified, Cisco backs off and instead tries to calm him down through discussion. Eventually, the subject naturally turns to the field that's keeping them here, which Eris warns is lethal because, of course, when you go to all the trouble to capture someone alive and then put them inside of some kind of containment area that you have set up ahead of time, naturally, you'll make the field lethal and don't tell them about it because... Anyway, Eris explains that the Dominion offers inclusion into them by choice, but at other times, when that is refused, they use the Jem'Hadar to just take it by force. It's like if the society from a piece of the action had become a galactic superpower. After enough of Quark's yelling, one of the Jem'Hadar finally comes in. He seems civil at first, but then he picks up Quark and throws him at the ground for no reason other than to watch him splat. He mentions that this is on orders from the Founders, the creators of the Dominion so secretive that some doubt they even exist. But this is really about two things, musing randomly about Klingons and making demands. The Dominion will no longer stand by and allow ships from your side to violate our territory. He also reveals that he knows things about the Alpha Quadrant, and they'll soon learn more from questioning Sisko, whom they know to be a high-ranking member of Starfleet who has up-to-date information on all activities related to the wormhole. It's going to be an invaluable interrogation. So naturally, he leaves and puts up the lethal force field, because of course giving Sisko the means to kill himself rather than give away information to the enemy couldn't possibly get in the way of their plans. Speaking of plans, Jake and Nog are left trying to come up with one when they discover what happened to Sisko and Quark. They can't beam them up because of the death field, and they can't fly back to the station for help, because I guess after what happened in Paradise, Sisko learned not to leave the runabout in orbit with the keys in the ignition. Jake doesn't know the authorization code to unlock it, so they're stuck here. So with no other options, Jake plans to open the guts and see what he can do. I mean, we all know that Star Trek systems are made for jailbreakers. The Jemadar makes his next stop, which is visiting DS9 to rattle the saber. Commander Sisko will serve as an example of what happens to anyone who interferes with the Dominion. What kind of interference are you talking about? Coming through the anomaly is interference enough. The Jemadar announces that they're keeping Cisco, give a list of the ships they've destroyed for territory violation, 
and to show just how serious they are and their threats should be taken, he walks through the containment force field easily, then hands over the info on a Bajoran pad taken from their conquest of the Bajoran colony, because just outright slapping Kira with his dick could probably take an eye out. One point has been raised about this situation that this is the point when the conflict could have ended. All the Federation had to do was accede to the wishes of the Dominion and there would be no conflict. It's the Federation's fault that things got worse. They were violating the sovereign borders of the Dominion and refused to stop. If you watch this show for any length of time, you know that I think Starfleet has done some very stupid and or immoral things over the years. This, though, this I can't agree with. I'm going to use knowledge available to us at this moment rather than the benefit of hindsight from later episodes. First and most obvious, even if the Federation listen, do you think the Klingons, Romulans, Cardassians, and anyone else are going to be intimidated into capitulating? Maybe some, sure. But all of them? I mean, come on. Martok would punch this Jemadar in the face for suggesting it, and Martok is known as the reasonable Klingon. Federation capitulation wouldn't change anything. If there was going to be a conflict, it would happen, and the station in Bajor would be right in the middle of it. Sooner or later, the Federation would get dragged into this confrontation unless they tried forming a treaty of non-aggression. And after what the Dominion did to their people, well, that's the equivalent of, please, not in the face! I mean, the other powers may very well be tempted to unite and carve up the Federation themselves. I mean, seeing them as cowards who will capitulate to strength rather than risk war. Second, there is nothing to indicate that the wormhole is within Dominion space. The refugees that our heroes have been dealing with shows Dominion expansion is taking place here and there, but not right up against the wormhole or all around that area. In the course of two years, the name of the Dominion has only come up once, and that wasn't easy to acquire. Now, really, this is more like when North Korea flips out and declares they have sovereignty over Saturn or something. The Dominion is perceiving it as a threat simply being on their side of the galaxy, not within their own territory. If they wanted to protect their borders, they need only say so. There is a neutral zone between the Federation and Romulus, after all. The same thing could be done here. And it's not as if the Dominion doesn't know about that. They've been gathering info on the Alpha Quadrant for long enough to know the politics, culture, and technology of all the major powers. So they have to know that all they need to tell the Federation is, here's our borders, keep a wide berth from it, and it would likely be obeyed. But instead of this, we have, as Worf says of the Romulans, claiming all that is within their vision. You just can't dictate... My side, your side! My side, your side! My side, your side! Third... There is nothing to suggest whatsoever that the Dominion would stay on their side of the galaxy. By insisting on no travel through the wormhole, the Dominion would be free to build fleets and breed soldiers in large numbers and launch an assault through with thousands of ships and catch the Alpha Quadrant completely unprepared, especially with every sign that they know how to neutralize some of their technology, while at the same time it would leave the Federation with no way to gain access to Dominion tech in order to undo whatever advantages that they have. This is basically gambling the entire future of the Federation, who is in the midst of dealing with a Maquis crisis because of Cardassians violating the treaty, on the hope that this new threat won't violate a treaty. What's worse, not even a treaty, a shaken fist and warning to back off. Hoping that someone who slaughters who knows how many people just to make a point isn't going to do something aggressive is like hoping a teenager left with a stack of porn videos won't masturbate. In the wake of the search, one and two, meaning after the Federation has had a bit of time to consider this, we have even more of a sign that the Dominion won't be content to uphold any agreement. The Founders are revealed to have a culture that is based upon years of fear, of being hunted by solids for the threat that they pose. And because of the nature of the Great Link, every horror experienced by any one of them is shared firsthand with all. It would be like an assault on each individual is taken personally by every single member of the group. This has resulted in a culture that is founded on xenophobia and also a strong sense of their own superiority. They could have been anything and so chose to call themselves gods. And they acted like it. According to the story Wayun told Odo in Treachery Faith and the Great River, a changeling stumbled into the forest where the Vorda lived as little more than apes, but those Vorda protected the changeling from those who wished to harm it. For that, the founders uplifted the Vorda, which is their reward. Yet they were made with obvious imperfections, a lack of visual acuity, for instance, and a lack of taste, both in the sense and in the aesthetic. 
And that was fine with the founders. Immunity to poison, that might come in handy for the work they would have them do. But the rest was unimportant, and so who cared if the Vorta suffered as a result? They'll just be programmed to be grateful for anything at all. Likewise, the Jemadar, which Weyun notes are bred to be soldiers, would have visual acuity because they need it. The founders can bestow that if they wish, they just haven't in the case of the Vorta. No, instead they gave them that plus strength, speed, endurance, etc., and it's probable that they were in some way related to the Tosk that appeared on the station in early Season 1, a species that had been bred as prey. The Founders may have adapted those into hunters instead, you know, given that the cloaking abilities of the Tosk and the Jem'Hadar look to be pretty much the same. The point is, the first and last concern of the Founders is the preservation of the Changelings. All else, literally all else, does not matter to them even slightly. Case in point, the founders, as I said, were so secretive, some question whether or not they even exist. And yet, after the search, it was quickly common knowledge that they not only existed, but that they were changelings. Now, this was a serious breach of thousands of years of security, and it happened only for one reason. The changelings allowed Odo to leave rather than forcing him to stay. The life of any changeling, even one that could compromise Dominion security, was worth any number of Vorta and Jemadar and innocent bystanders that would die due to such a security breach. They are that convinced of their superiority over the lives of solids. In the face of such an adversary, the idea that they would be content to stay, especially after telling Odo they expected to encounter the Federation two centuries later, makes it clear that they are looking to slowly expand across space until everything is under their control. Finally, with the benefit of hindsight, we also see it as the right move. The Dominion became involved in pitting the Alpha Quadrant powers against each other, and then moved in for direct military conquest when that was required. This doesn't show that they were antagonized, it shows that they always considered the powers of the Alpha Quadrant a threat. Because remember, in the Gamma Quadrant, there was only the Dominion as far as powers went. There was no sign of any other significant nation over there likely for the same reason that the Delta Quadrant didn't really have anything due to the Borg. One incredibly powerful nation can disrupt any number of smaller powers so that they are no longer a threat. The Alpha Quadrant had the Federation as an X factor. It's a powerful nation that isn't interested in military expansion, but was nevertheless prepared to aggressively defend its sovereignty if it came down to it. So it became strong enough in order to do so. And so others became strong enough to ensure that they wouldn't be outmatched by the Federation if war began, and this arms race winds up leading to three large military powers, and then some smaller ones such as the Cardassians. These significant forces could pose a threat to the Founders, so eliminating them would be the only viable option if they insist on remaining the dominant power. And we saw how that worked. They infiltrated the Klingon leadership to start a war with both the Federation and the Cardassians. The former then weakened two significant threats, and the latter drove a desperate Cardassia into seeking protection by joining the Dominion, thereby giving the alpha, them an Alpha Quadrant foothold for later conquest. Everything says that this was carefully considered, and none of it suggests that the Dominion would have done otherwise if the Federation had not crossed the wormhole ever again. I mean, why wouldn't they? None of that required them to expend a single bit of military effort on their own, just slipping agents behind enemy lines and creating havoc. So no, I don't buy it. The Federation is not perfect no matter what Gene's vision says, but they are not to blame for this conflict. But let's get back to Cisco, who has finally gotten the panel off of the lock on Eris's collar. This thing is blocking her telekinetic abilities, which she could use to get them out of this. But we need to pick that lock, and we all know that Quark put points into that instead of into diplomacy, so he should be able to take care of it. But he finally blows up because Sisko has been ordering him around and goes into another speech about human C. Ferengi. They are a reminder of the way things were. Except that Quark says, we may do things you don't like, but you've done worse. He lists things like concentration camps, interstellar war, and slavery which naturally gets Sisko's attention, his family being from New Orleans. While not definitely establishing it, it certainly suggests that his ancestors came to America as slaves. And as someone with a strong sense of history, Sisko would probably know that. Of course, it should be pointed out that Ferengi treat their women as second-class citizens to a degree that few human cultures ever matched, and the episode Acquisition showed that the Ferengi would sell women into slavery when given a chance. 
Although that's Enterprise, which, you know, is like bringing a rubber dildo to a knife fight. But you get the point. Even if you factor that in, Quark has a point that the Ferengi haven't stooped to the level that humans have frequently done. They've made mistakes, but not ones that big. I don't think that's it. Try it. I have a hunch. All right. Let's see. Warning. Warp core collapse at 10 seconds. But mistakes nevertheless. Meanwhile, Starfleet has decided that the Odyssey should investigate the Jemadar threat to help decide what to do, and the captain agrees to let them come along in retrofitted runabouts to help, since they're going to need time to evacuate non-essential personnel from the Odyssey. It's a Galaxy-class starship, remember, just like the Enterprise. Convenient, because it means we can recycle the effects shot from Emissary. But off they go, a Galaxy-class starship and some runabouts, which, hey, it may not seem like much, but those can be a force to be reckoned with. Although some credit has to go to the pilot. I think that piloting a runabout might have been a good lesson even if it wasn't for the science project. Luckily for them, the rescue fleet arrives and the chief beams over to put the ship back together again while they head towards rescuing Cisco and Quark, who have already finished step one and removed the telepathic suppressor. So, a quick mind blast and they're free. Now it's just a matter of the armed super soldiers that are guarding them. But luckily, despite putting them inside a death field, it must be vital that they are still alive because the guard charges Cisco trying to hit him with the gun instead of just shooting him with it. Well, he pays for that, but the Jemadar in space probably won't be as accommodating. In fact, their guns go straight through the shields no matter how much technobabble the Federation throws at them. O'Brien does get a chance to find and rescue Cisco, Quark, and Eris, but the Jemadar are really whooping their asses now. Now, remember, this was about three weeks after all good things had closed out TNG, and here is a Galaxy-class starship losing terribly in this fight until finally... <laughs> the message of this is, this is an enemy that could have destroyed even the Enterprise. Also, never play chicken with a Jemadar. During that, Quark had made the comment that the telekinetic inhibitors that he have seen have been much bulkier than the one that he's removed from Eris, so he stopped to grab it before they left. Once they return, though, he takes Sisko aside to talk about it. Seems that the reason it's so light and thin is not so that you can have that fresh feeling no matter what day it is, but because it's just a lock, nothing more. Eris is actually a Dominion agent. Fitting, Eris was the goddess who threw the apple that started the Trojan War. And after the Trojan War was the Odyssey, you see how that stuff all weaves together? You might wonder why Sisko doesn't feed her false intel instead of confronting her, but I think after all we've seen, playing it safe and snatching her while they still could was probably the better move. Of course, it's moot because she beams herself away. No idea where, but they'll be back. And without their telekinesis. But let's try not to think about that, even though it was kind of sort of a major plot point, wasn't it? Post-episode follow-up, annoying character goes to Quark. While he's not annoying throughout the entire piece, the stuff at the beginning is a bit much. All scores are relative to the series, so final score for the Jemadar is 6 out of 10. It's a slightly above average DS9 episode, although don't let that seem like it's bad. It's a vitally important one, and certainly a hell of a lot better than the Neutral Zone's groundwork for the Borg. It's a little slow in some places, especially the beginning, but the wow factor rapidly takes hold and the climax and realization of just how things will change is memorable. This was the small window when Deep Space Nine was the only new Trek on television and was a great hook for people wanting to see what they were up to on that station show. The threat of the Dominion was well established and will lead to the memorable two-part start of the following season with the search and the introduction of the USS Ben Sisko's motherfucking pimp hand. Thank <laughs> you.